Hello everybody and welcome to PlatformCon 2024. I'm Kasper and I'm really excited to talk about one of my favorite topics and that is about driving platform adoption the right way. Because you can build the nicest platform in the world if nobody's using it, you have a fundamental problem. And there are a few rules that you can apply that will help you drive this adoption and I want to share those rules. I want to share the observations from many, many, many platform engineering journeys I've had the pleasure to be on. Now, the first thing that I want to do is something a little unconventional, and that is quoting Napoleon Bonaparte, because I think Napoleon should be quoted more if it comes to platform engineering. Now, I'm not entirely sure whether he meant platform engineering when he uh, said that sentence, but I, he might just, um, that's, that might have just been one of the things that what was on his mind because it fits so damn well. He said, 10 people who yell make more noise than 10,000 who keep silent. Let's take a second and think about what that means. If you have 10 infrastructure teams, <clears throat> 10 developers, <clears throat> 10 security people, it doesn't matter who it is, 10 people who really love what you've built and don't want to work without it and go to their peers and say, this is amazing. This is really making my life better. Then you are a done deal. You won. But if you have 10 people that actively work against you, then it doesn't matter whether there are 10,000 that think you're okay. You are not going to survive the next 12 months in that position. And this is such an important lesson if it comes to platform engineering and how to drive adoption for platform engineering. You need the first advocates. You need to build something for them that is 10 times better than what they're using right now. And I want to take you on a quick journey exploring those rules and how to approach this. Now, the first thing that I want to shed some light on is whom do I mean if I'm referring to an advocate. Who could be our advocate? And why would they be our advocate? There is a little bit of a one-dimensional view if it comes to platform engineering that it is about developer experience. It's about what the developer thinks. It's about whether the developer is happy or not. And the developers are indeed absolutely important. No question, absolutely. But the thing is, there are more people involved in building applications than just the application developers. There are like a ton of people that are also directly affected by your flat platform. The infrastructure teams, the DB admins, the security groups, your product managers, your managers, all of those are involved. And now, of course, the developers are often very vocal and they have a lot of buying power and they're definitely one of the more important users, but they're not the only important user. And it might just be that the developers are not that sad that they can just send a Slack request to an operations person to debug a deployment. Because for them, it's just sending a Slack, uh, going for a coffee, and then um, at some point they'll get an answer and they continue. You know, some people hate this, some people maybe just don't care. But for the receiving end, for the infrastructure teams, that is a terrible experience because now they have to work through a lot of repetitive requests from developers. And here's our first learning. The developers can be advocates because now they can do things in self-service and it's even more delightful. But the infrastructure teams can be as important from an advocacy point of view as can the security teams that have to review, you know, Terraform scripts somebody wrote to make sure that they're actually compliant all of those are things that we can actually strip away. And sometimes it can just be a little easier to serve those with a huge amount of pain. And that might not be the application developer, or it might be in short, I don't know, you have to figure that out, but just make sure you're open-minded of who could be your adv advocate and why would they consider being an advocate. Now, here are my top rules to create the first 10 advocates. Rule number one is start small and scale slow. And you have no idea how slow I want you to scale. People always think, yeah, you know, I'll take like a couple weeks. No, you want to take a long, long time and really do these things step by step. You're building a product. Building a product takes time. 
Second, you want to pick the right first team to start with. Picking the wrong team can be the end of your initiative. Third, you want to overinvest into the experience of that first team. And fourth, you want to get them to use this every single day. Every single day, every single developer in the product team needs to use your platform in order for us to say, okay, you really got adoption. You're really creating advocates. Cool. Let's dive right in. If we would plot a platform engineering initiative on a timeline, I always recommend building a minimum viable platform first. Very simply because if you just go out and survey some people, I don't think they can give you an answer. It's the Steve Jobs problem. You ask people whether they want an iPhone. They've never seen one. Not sure what you want to ask them. Build something lean in four to eight weeks that is um, interesting to look at and gives a, gives a first idea of how that platform world could look like. Use this MVP to win over your first product team to say, okay, I'll actually go on this platform and try it out and experience this. And then you want to spend a long, long period of at least three months that is just about optimizing your MVP to optimally serve that one product team. Not 10 product teams, one product team. Overinvest in the experience of one team. Think about what resources their application needs and build beautiful golden paths against it. Think about the interfaces that they prefer. Uh, is this a team that wants to have click ops? Is this a team that wants to stay in code? Is this a team that loves CLIs? It doesn't, it doesn't matter what other teams want, just focus on this one team. Platform engineering is a little bit like building a startup. And there's a fantastic guy, I think, who's, who worked at Y Combinator, Paul Graham. And Paul Graham always said, at the start of a startup, you should build things that don't scale. And the same thing holds true here. You should not think about scale. You should think about making the life of that one team amazing. Once you do this, people will queue up and want to be on your, on your, um, on your uh, platform because the first team is so ecstatic and so positive that they go and tell their person to say, we're already on this new thing and you should be on this too. And that is significantly more powerful than if you tell them how this might hypothetically look like. The second um, most important rule is that you pick the right product team to start with. And as a rule of thumb, you want to take all the teams you could possibly think of and you want to force rank them. And the most appealing teams are teams that are just tipping their toes into a new world that are in front of a transformation anyways. I'm, I don't know about your estate, but let's say you are on Kubernetes or some are on Kubernetes and some are not. The perfect teams are the ones that are just making that transformation into Kubernetes because they're transforming anyways and you can slot in beautifully and they have no prior bias or experience, those definitely should make it to the top of the list. Second, you should look at those teams that are maybe already on that new technology, let's stick with Kubernetes, but that say, well, this is so difficult, the ones that really feel the pain. Lower on your list should be the ones that are already sufficient and they're like great at Helm charts and Terraform and everything, and they want to write this on their resume, resume and... Um, show off to their friends that there are such, such experts in application configurations. Those people come last. Your platform has to have a very, fairly significant level of maturity to be able to actually deal with those teams. And at the very bottom, that's your legacy, your legacy applications. Don't touch them. Just leave them there for now until they're ready to tip their toes into the new world. Once you have pick the right team, go in and really analyze what resources do they use, how do they consume, how do they want their platform, interview them, show them the MVP, um, just as we said uh, earlier, and then make sure that you might even want to do the integration and the transitional work for them so it's as smooth as possible. 
Third, you then over-invest into the experience. And that's really where you want to make them ecstatic. You observe how they're working. You do regular user interviews. You sit next to them and see whether the thing that you're actually that you've actually built um, is making a difference. You want to give them something they always wanted. One of the things that I always recommend for developers, for instance, is ephemeral environments. Fantastic, right? That's something that directly and immediately benefits them. For infrastructure teams, it would be uh, things like resource definitions, reusable infrastructure components, fleet updates, things that really reduce the workload and allow these teams to focus less on repetitive work and more on interesting optimization. You want to focus on day-to-day -day usage. If I'm looking at a good amount of the platforms that are built, especially the ones that are just, you know, let's put a UI on top of our existing pipeline mess, those are not things that are really used every day. Um, if you're optimizing on scaffolding a new microservice, how often do you scaffold a new microservice? Every, I don't know, four, five months. And that is not usage. Good usage of your platform means every single developer is touching this every single day. And that doesn't mean that they know that they're interacting with your platform. Absolutely not. This can just mean that they're interacting with your APIs in the background. It's like this laptop has Intel inside and you don't really think about Intel. It just really works well and you don't want to miss that. You want to follow the North Star of thank yous and you want to have a situation where that first product team, and if I say product team, I mean the devs, I mean the infrastructure people, I mean the security people involved, I mean the product managers, I mean the managers, all of those should say thank you, all of those should become advocates. Only once you have this, do you tip your toes into expansion and scale. And this is now where you really look at driving usage. And there are again, four rules. First, you want to measure. You need to make your success tangible because the best feeling and the most cushy, you know, sentiment in the world cannot beat tangible results and numbers. Second, you want to share your success. Third, you again want to continue prioritizing the right teams. And fourth, you want to consider sticks and carrots. You want to make it nice to be on, but not so nice to be off your platform. The first thing is measurements. Measure, measure, measure. Measure the current state before the platform, get the first team on, measure the outcome, create a return on investment calculation, and then show this and then scale. Make it very tangible, do great things and talk about it, and um, help management teams and other application developers to understand why this makes a difference. Then share your success. Don't be shy, go out and always try to let the advocates talk. And because nobody believes people that say they're great themselves, everybody believes people that have other people say that they're great. And that's exactly what you should do as well. Then think about prioritizing the right next team. You do not want to become overly confident. If you've built a platform for five months, this is an immature platform. You will need more time until you are ready to onboard the very sophisticated teams. Try to bring in the teams that are less sophisticated. Try to bring in the teams that look similar to your first team. Try to take the next team, analyze the gap between what you have right now, what you need, and step by step by step, fill in the gaps. Do not assume you will ever have 80% estate coverage. That is not going to happen. I don't know any platform in the entire world that has 100% estate coverage. A good platform has maybe 70, 80% estate coverage. There's also like a big case to be made that platforms have like an upper boundary. I've not seen many teams that or many platforms that have more than a thousand users on the same platform because these platforms at some point differ so much that it makes more sense to then have different platforms run in parallel. Make sure you prioritize the right next team. And then considering introducing sticks and carrots. 
And what I mean by this is think about what are the things that we could make it even nicer to be on the platform. Maybe if a developer is deploying through the platform, they are not on call. Maybe they don't need to wait for security reviews. Maybe if they have a request, they're queued first. It, there needs to be a very, very tangible reason why a developer is leaving the platform, is going off the golden path and doing um, the everything on their own. Because if they do this, they drive up the cost of maintenance. And so there should be a proper reason why this makes sense. All right, I hope this was helpful. I wish you all the best in the world on your platform engineering journey. If you have questions, reach out. I always love to chat and enjoy PlatformCon 2024.